From the darkest corners of Tumblr comes a podcast where we take two of your favorite fictional characters, get them together, and ask, Do we ship it? That's right, it's a spooky edition of Ships in the Night! Because it's October. We're broadcasting live, or should I say, undead, from the back of a haunted Halloween warehouse. Ooh. I keep telling my landlord they can't bill it that way. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everybody, I'm Greg Goodness. I'm Zach Wilson, and we've got a very fun episode of Ships in the Night. We're going to be doing a whole bunch of horror specials for Halloween in the, the three weeks that we have left in October. And so we had to get a great guest to kick off our horror season. And I want to introduce horror filmmaker Charlie Piper. Hello, hello, everybody. Uh, Charlie's a great friend. And uh, when we started, when we thought horror, you were the literally the first person that we made the list with. Acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, I come to mind a lot for people when they think about horrible things. So, yeah. <laughs> well, you make so many cool, like, practical puppets. And I'm, a, I'm a monster. Creatures. I'm yeah. a monster maker. I work in horror. I do puppets and creatures and psychological horror. Well, well we do our own bit of horrifying things here yeah. at Ships in the Night, and I think it's time that we get started. Mm -hmm. uh, and this first ship was sent in to us by a good friend of the podcast, former guest on the show, Harrison Pettit. Let's find the love story between... Annie Wilkes oh boy. from Misery and Jack Torrance from The Shining. It's Dang. an all Stephen King love affair. What do you guys think? Castle Rock just got harder. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it does all take place within the Stephen King universe. So it is all interconnected. Yeah, ostensibly, these two could meet like in the backwoods of Maine or something. Yeah. To I the point that this is almost not even a crossover ship. But I think for the purposes of like those two films don't really hit each other. No, no, but they're, we're they're about them. to. Yes. yes. <laughs> so, I mean, so what do you guys think? Like, do you see this working? I mean, you have an author and you mm -hmm. have someone who is clearly obsessed. A strong with, critic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in many ways. Has some choice words. Yeah. yeah. So I think that if Jack can write something that really grabs her attention, then there may be something there. Yeah. It might start off well. <laughs> I mean, the, the like, there is a connection. There is a, a love connection going on there. But I, we got to figure out, what's the meet cute? Mm. How do these two get together? <laughs> there's the class, there's the angle we use a bunch of times where it's at a convention. <laughs> <laughs> um Unless it's something like... Well, we got to deviate slightly from the timeline to create what's going on. But with all the different levels of realities, you know, and all things go according to the whim of the beam, if you want to get Dark Tower into Universal Stephen King about it. And we do. Uh, let's say, yeah, let's say Jack actually kind of came out the other side of the Overlook, not dead, mm. and um, alive... And with a book that wasn't just one sentence a thousand times. <laughs> and that got attention enough from Annie. And I see that. Yeah. I see that. So a slight twist on the ending, but it at least yeah, he's like, you know, he's mm -hmm. doing book signings. He's traveling around. Yeah. He's actually slightly successful, you know. And I am willing to bet that Annie comes out the other end of misery like, you know what? I think that I have a place in the book world. Mm -hmm. I think that I am a yeah. great editor. I need to get out yeah. there and meet some other authors and really just hone their vision, you know, really yeah. help them sharpen their story into the best possible exactly. thing it can yeah. be. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, she gets a hold of this manuscript and is like, listen, Jack, love what you've done here. Uh, can't write Jack, all work and no play makes Jack dull boys 10,000 mm -hmm. times over. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a nugget of truth there. Yeah, and it's relatable, but let's, uh, <laughs> let's uh, you know, mix it up a bit. And I think Jack would initially be intrigued by this, because, all right, let's go at least according to the filmic version. He wouldn't be inherently immediately used to a strong woman who says what's what, because <laughs> he's been a bit, you know. I mean, the, the Wendy in the book is, a, is not a, at all like the Wendy in the film, but let's be honest, the film is what people are connected to, and mm -hmm. it works on a stronger level. But so, yeah, he'd... You know, maybe initially he'd be like, what the hell is up with her? You know, sort of thing. But then he'd be like, oh, shit, what the hell's up with her? You know? <laughs> I, I think I know what happens from there, though, mm. because 
she's got all these notes on his book, like on these things that he has to rework. And it's like, he's like, I'm going to have to, this is going to take me months to figure out. And she's like, all right, that's fine. I have the perfect plan. You and me, are, we're going to go out to the middle of the woods. I go. rented <laughs> out this big house in the middle mm -hmm. of nowhere. Yeah. Uh, it's just up in the, up in the mountains and we're just going to work on your book. And Jack's <laughs> like, yeah, I think that's a, that sounds like a good idea. <laughs> There's nothing could go wrong with that. It was perfectly fine last time. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's just the two of them driving up a winding mm -hmm. mountain. We yeah. will write this book together. <laughs> so then it literally just turns into like they're they're staying at this while he works on it. And she's reading pages as mm -hmm. he continues to write and, and workshop oh. it. He's seeing ghosts of all the writers past that have been yeah. in there. And, like, and he's like, what's with your feet, ghosts? <laughs> Why they, are you hobbling around? They Airbnb a big cabin. That's basically what's Perfect. going on Perfect. here. <laughs> and I think it, it would work to a point. But then as the mania sets in and Jack and he starts getting feisty, she keeps whipping him right back into shape and he don't know what to do. He's not used to it. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. what I see happening. It's like he comes through a door with an mm -hmm. axe like, here's Johnny. And she's like, and here are my latest notes on mm -hmm. the chapter five. Mm -hmm. Like, you, <laughs> listen, uh, thematically, we have some major issues to work through. Look, by chapter 30, Jack has to be a dull man, is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> I like this. So she's keeping him in check. And I almost like... I think at that point, he becomes almost like a wily coyote sort of thing. Totally, yeah. Where he's like trying to get her over and over again. He and takes like, out the axe, she takes out the big sledgehammer thing. Yeah, there. exactly. Yeah. And it's like he's convening with all of these ghosts like, oh, gosh, I just can't get to her. <laughs> So it keeps going, and they're yeah, they're torturing each other. It becomes this like he wakes up and she's got the block between his legs. Annie again, <laughs> <laughs> Annie darling. <laughs> um, but so okay, so that's like a that's a great like start to their their story. It's like getting us through. But what how what is it like? What happens when the book is done? Because that does seem to be this mm. seems like it would keep him focused at least a little bit or. Did they get distracted when they start to fall for each other? Oh, that's a good point. Is like, can you even finish the book when this happens? Like, here's what I'm willing to bet is that Jack is going to take all of this anger and frustration, all this like cat and mouse psychological horror stuff, and that becomes the book. It's like, my time with Annie by Jack. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he can't help but write mm -hmm. what he knows from his own life because exactly. he's not that imaginative. <laughs> <laughs> and so, book comes out. Number one bestseller, like New York Times bestseller. His face yeah. is plastered. Dethroned all Sutter over. Kane from the top of the book lists. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And so I think that while he is on like the champagne tour with Annie, like, mm -hmm. you did it, Annie. You helped me write the book. Like at that point, it's like, yeah, I always knew we were a good match for each other. And then like closer, closer, closer. She hits him with a sledgehammer, and then they kiss. <laughs> oh, they probably, I mean, that no, they, they've been going at it for months at this point. <laughs> oh, yeah? It's been really okay. nasty. Like, the fucking cabin, you do not want to be the next person lying at the Airbnb there, because it's like, it's like, is this, uh, it, honestly, you hope it's ectoplasm from ghosts, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> But it's arguably not, because are there even ghosts at all, or is it all still in Jack's head? Dude, that's what the book becomes. Booyah. It becomes a paranormal, mm. erotic, oh, no. thriller. Yeah. Yeah. My time with Annie is like, I was talking with the ghosts, and then mm. her bosom popped around the corner mm. like so many frozen peaks I've seen before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I mean, I mean, if we're... <sighs> there's now two... Annie Wilkes's. It has, a, I think, the next season of Castle Rock, Annie Wilkes is played by, oh, what's her face from Party Down? Uh, and it's like a young, like, sexy nurse what? version of Annie Wilkes coming into town. I think it premieres later this month. So, anyway, you know, if, if, if we're going to that, Annie Wilkes, like, Jeepers. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> I, no, I'm only, I refuse. I'm only picturing this with <laughs> yeah. classic Kathy yeah. Bates. Yeah. <laughs> Annie yeah. Wilkes. No, Kathy Bates makes sense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I totally see this. The Maybe the, like, there's like a quote of was like, no work and torture play makes Jack an excited boy. There you go. Yeah. 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 
Mm. Mm. And he has to rewrite that. It's like, when you say all torturing my balls makes Jack extremely horny, like we have to, we have to massage that a little. And he's like, yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. So, okay. So these two are hooking up. The book comes out. It's a bestseller. Yeah. It's the next 50 shades of gray. Oh yeah. Yeah. Essentially. But what does that do to this relationship? Ruins it. Jack wants all the attention for himself. He's an arrogant son of a bitch and can't deal with the fact that it mostly comes from his uh, paramour, as it were. He does. He does hate his. Like he does. He's a, he's, he's a misogynist, a big dog. He <laughs> is a terrible husband oh, gosh, in The Shining. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, Not exactly an A plus father either. Uh, no, no, especially if you get into the breaking book version. Breaking his kid's arm. Yeah. yeah. Um, can't get rid of those bees. God, come on. <laughs> Fucking hedge animals giving him the roof, roof. You know, he's like, come on. <laughs> but Jack needs to f- stop end the relationship then. I would argue that Jack would be the kind of crazy person who, like, tries to drag this along. Mm-hmm. And then it's Annie who, being the independent woman that she oh, there is. There you go. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. I think she might. And Charlie, you can correct me if I'm wrong on mm. this. Would Annie be the one to say like snap snap no no sir like maybe I'm gonna maybe cut this out maybe because Annie gets off on the control so being with someone who actually kind of liked the creative thing she was giving her would in the end turn her off yeah oh right man that so is brutal she'd be like wait a second this ain't no good he kind of likes me that's annoying she only wants the unavailable yeah man. yeah there you go. <laughs> Oh man, he's like tie me down and torture yes, me. Yes, exactly. She's, she's like, like that. Where's the fun in that? Yeah, exactly. Like at least throw yourself off of a deserted road and right? break a leg right? or something. Bring some mystery back to the relationship, yeah. Jack. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Ooh. when you get down to it, I think that there's only one way that this relationship is gonna end. Mm. You're talking about Jack Torrance and Annie Wilkes. Somebody gonna die. Yeah. The question is, who's it going to be? Because I think what ends up happening is you basically have a replay of both movies Mm -hmm. and like the third act of both movies happening at the same time where (laughs) Jack is tied to a bed because he won't take her notes on the sequel novel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And but he's trying to get out to get an axe to just murder the hell out of her. Who wins in that battle? (laughs) They say that the person who has the most power in the relationship is the person who cares the least. Mm. Mm. (laughs) I'm willing to bet that Jack gets tied up on this bed, right? And is like, oh, here comes the pain. And then he's like, "Uh, Annie? Ah. Annie? And Annie is just like in a snowplow, like driving off the mountain, like... I'm going to get myself like a nice mani petty. I'm going to take back and uh, take back my Sunday, get my groove back. I am going to become the Annie that she's I secretly once been loved. messaging Alan Pangborn on the side. <laughs> like, yeah. Back to Castle Rock. Exactly. And Jack is just like frozen on the bed with that <laughs> dumbass expression <laughs> on his face. <laughs> like, she'll be back any minute. <laughs> I like that. And then what photo are we ending with a zoom in on? (laughs) Is it the back? We zoom in on the back jacket cover of the book and it's only Annie on it. Oh, there you go. That's perfect. That's perfect. (laughs) And thus brings a close to the story of (laughs) Annie Wilkes and Jack Torrance. Dang. So now we got to ask Annie Wilkes and Jack Torrance, do you ship it? Oh, hell yeah. (laughs) I'd watch that. I'd be like, Dang. Yeah, I gotta side with Charlie on this one. It's so entertaining. <laughs> I totally ship it because look, it neither one of the, both of them have bad endings to begin with, but at least in this version, Jack gets a little bit more like out of his career, and Annie uh, gets to ride off into the sunset of success. Yeah, I'm fine with Jack dying a second time. <laughs> like whatever, he's a jerk. He deserves it. I do like the image of Annie driving away as like, I don't know, fast car plays in the background. 
And she just becomes like a real self-actualized woman, like mm-hmm. really makes it in the book writing world. A flock of sparrows are startled by her car. So the <laughs> sparrows are flying again as Annie Wilkes <laughs> roams away. Yeah. Yeah, look, I mean, look, I don't want to ship these two forever. They're not OTP or nothing, but like, I think this is a real fun relationship for us to watch. Yeah, for Ooh, sure. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, with that behind us, uh, we're going to go bust down some doors and we'll be right back with our second horror ship of the night. And we're back. Whoa. It was just so scary. I'm scared. I mean, look, there's a lot of horror going on today. Clearly. But it's time for this to get into some of the more twisted corners of the horror oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> of the horror space uh, with this ship that was sent to us via email. Uh, remember that you can send your ships into us via email at ships in the night email at gmail.com. So confusing. It's scary. <laughs> I was about to say your email address actually is email in it. <laughs> That's great. That's, that awesome. <laughs> um, but this one ah is from David Cronenberg's The Fly. It's Seth Brundle. Oh, yeah. And from Franz Kafka's The Metamorphosis. You know it. Grigor Samsa. What do you guys think? I think this is a dream come true. (laughs) (laughs) It is very specifically, I feel like, your dream, Charlie. Oh, for sure. I mean, I... When I was a kid, I was a creepy kid, of course, and you know some of the bedtime stories my dad read to me were uh, Kafka. So the Metamorphosis was actually a, a bedtime story. For I me was as a gonna kid. say Franz <laughs> Kafka in the middle of that as a joke, and then it, <laughs> no, it's it real. was just it's real. real. All right, well, yeah. So we've got a uh, a, a capitalist nightmare scenario. Oh yeah, uh, for, for Gregor Samson with a. Uh, with the fly, Tech which bro is nightmare, yeah, 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 which is yeah, it's like a, it's it's a, well, there's a lot of hubris going on in this ship right from for the sure, top for sure. Uh, so wow, we got to get these two together. What's the meat cute for for well, it's Grigor interesting. And Seth? So because uh, like the metamorphosis, it opens up famously that Gregor is awoken from uneasy dreams to find himself turned into an insect. So, oh my god, but we don't know the origin. Right, uh, yeah. Well, we, you know, we, we know his family and his sister and his parents and all, but... Oh, we so, don't know how the bug thing happened. Right, which is a big part of it. And maybe Seth mm. Brundle is responsible. He had a summer in Prague. Who hasn't? <laughs> and, uh, I know I did. Jeepers. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Fucking Brundle, man. He's messing things up left and right. He can't... In America, in... Europe. He can't get per. He can't get legal permission to to mm-hmm. do these experiments in the U.S. Yeah. So he has to move it to another country, mm-hmm. and he just he goes to Prague. Yeah, it's a beautiful scenic city. Why would he not want to be there? Well, Gregor does say that he's like a lonely clerk. Oh and yeah, it's like sort of a he lower would, cog you know, in the machine. He's reading a newspaper on his like two minutes off time. He sees a little classified like paid experiment come as you are he's like oh you make some extra money on the side because those clerking ain't going nowhere <laughs> but in order to do that uh jeff goldblum being the tech bro that he is mm-hmm. is like mm, yeah well you know you're gonna sign up for this and uh, uh you may have to you know, subject yourself to some experimentation that's just standard boilerplate kind of stuff you're an independent contractor so uh you have to sign <laughs> on the dotted line here and you'll have your five shekels and be on your way <laughs> shekels <laughs> Not right at all. We're going to move past it. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Cronins. <laughs> appropriately enough for a Cronenbergian uh, body horror love story. Wow. So these two start, so he starts running experiments either mm-hmm. with him or it, it or on, is, is it on him right away? Or are these two just like, is it like he hired an assistant at first? Maybe he hired an assistant at first, but something beyond the wings of a fly start to grow between them. As it were. I don't he, know. Yeah, he hires him. Listen, this is his plan to create DoorDash in Prague, and he is teleporting him from the local McDonald's mm. to... Bug Bash. Yeah, exactly, wherever it needs to go. And during that process, he accidentally turns yeah. Gregor you into... Want to get to Old Town, but not deal with the other horrible, ugly American tourists? Just use my uh, telepod, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, what if it's a thing where... 
uh, Seth starts to have feelings for his young assistant, mm -hmm. but that's when, right around when that happens, is when the the teleport experiment goes wrong and he starts to turn into the fly. There you go. And yeah. he knows it's happening. He he realizes that he's turning. Uh, excuse me, though. It would technically be a dung beetle for Gregor. Beetle. I'm sorry. <laughs> Not a cockroach, or, as a lot of translations have. It's a it's a dung beetle. Well, this is the thing. Is is Seth is now transforming. But he wants his his assistant to mm. transform with him. He wants him to share it. Yeah, he wants Follow to. That path. Yeah, he's like you're beautiful, and I can make you even more beautiful. <laughs> Let's not have politics together. We'll <laughs> both be bugs. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And he sticks him in mm -hmm. with a beetle. Listen, an important part of this company's work culture is that we all turn into bugs, okay? <laughs> <laughs> like, you gotta get on board. I need you to be a team Equal player, Gregor. opportunity, <laughs> bodily transmorphic <laughs> behavior. And these two just start transforming, like, step by step together, and, like, oh, man, the twisted sex that's going on between these two bug Fucked. monsters. Yeah. It, even Cronenberg would have nightmares. Yeah. Somewhere else, William S. Burroughs is like, oh, I should have thought of this. <laughs> <laughs> but so how does that relationship start to go? Because like, clearly they're two like, major experiments, but how mm. does Grigor feel about being transformed? Well, in this version, I mean, he's like, well, shit, here we go. Here we go again. <laughs> Oh, he's another listening to his, Monday at the office. He's listening to his his, uh, his you know bug pod, and it's like this is the story of a bug. <laughs> and he's just like, let's roll. Let's just let's fuck our bug brains out. He's into it. He's like, oh man, yeah, yeah. Brundle, give give, give me that Brundle. <laughs> I mean, it's like, yeah, he's like this weird, tall, bizarre American dude with buggy eyes is into me, like. Oh, well, whatever. It's better than nothing, I guess. <laughs> so that's why, and that's why he was so willing to mm -hmm. go along with it. Cause like maybe this was like a thing where there's just like, I mean, he's got nothing else going on. He lives like in a little room in an apartment where his parents live. If I remember the story correctly, like he's got, he's got nothing. He was just looking for some excitement in his life, some way out of that, the humdrum boredness that mm -hmm. he's Even those spewing mandibles, baby. Yeah. Something <laughs> to perk up them antennae. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens that like to, to these two though because because as they start to transform i mean we saw brundle go a little crazy yeah does he start to get like jealous of of whoever gregor needs to go back to his family he's like you i'm your family now does it turn violent listen man i really yeah. need you to stick around at the office i know we're pulling 80 hour work days here but bugs don't have time yeah we're we're on the verge of something big here man i mean it's definitely a bad relationship but yeah. oh baby i mean it's like look brundle's not a good boyfriend in the fly so i think he just he turns into a pretty abusive boyfriend to gregor mm -hmm. yeah and Gregor's like he's a stand-up dude. He's like he's but trying also to a pushover. That's the problem. With he Gregor. is. He is. He's trying to provide for his family. Like he's like a good guy, but yeah, he's not going to fight back. He's against... got daddy issues. He's yeah. terrified of his father. He's that was Kafka. We all know this. And so, I mean, that's <laughs> sorry. That's the thing. Like they start to realize that he is. He starts to realize that he's not happy. Yeah. At a, at a certain point, and maybe that's when the transformation becomes full yeah i'm tired of pushing your dung uphill <laughs> <laughs> what about my dung what about my need slash dung mm -hmm. yes exactly i'm willing to bet that yeah like and as we sort of saw in uh the kafka story when he does try to assert himself that's when everything goes to shit so I think that the moment that he tries to be like, you know what, I need something in this relationship. Jeff Goldblum is just going to go hog wild and start being like, you know what, I'm issuing pink slips to this entire company. We are slash and burn in the R&D, and Gregor, you are the first to go. Oh, man, he fires Bugs his boyfriend. Bugs don't have unions. <laughs> Bugs don't have unions. <laughs> So yeah, he's like, you are fired, and by that, <laughs> I mean I have a shotgun and I am coming after you. Maybe oh, yeah. a comically oversized fly swatter. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, but so just, I think this is where Gregor, like, he he scampers out. He like takes his beetle form, spreads them wings, and just like flutters out the window mm -hmm. to run back to his bedroom. Where I thought my family was bad. Now they're, they're peachy keen compared to this bullshit. Well, yeah, he thinks he's going back to his family after like I was I was in this terrible relationship. I, I'm so glad I'm home. And then he wakes up and they're like, oh, 
<laughs> yeah, they don't know what to do. They're like, oh god, they're throwing apples in his back. They're landing there. They're mushy. And then you have, and then oh. you basically have the story of the metamorphosis from yeah. there. He is another yeah. victim of a poor work life balance Ooh-hoo. that the capitalist system has forced upon everyone. He spent so much time at the office that he let his family life degrade and now he will never get it back. These capitalist fly dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck them. But so what happens to Seth from there? I mean, does he regret kicking Gregor out? Does he go searching for him? Because there's a tragic story where he like realizes the mistake that he's made. Oh, as yeah. like as he does somewhat in the fly, like realizes how horrifying he's become. And he goes out to find Gregor, but he only gets there on that final day when he is f- when Gregor's finally given up on mm-hmm. life and crawled under the couch to die. I think that he would definitely regret it. And I think that then he would then use that as like a branding experience for his future. Yes. He would take and be like, listen, I was very overworked as a bug scientist, but now I want to share my gift with you for $30. I will tell you how to find a better work-life balance and also how to eat your baby. Yeah, he's like, yeah, you know, like, he's like, I'm going to move forward from this. I realized... Don't go for the moody, broody Czech boys. Let's find someone of the same mindset, of the same look. I need someone who's a high-powered, mental, crazy, bug-eyed, doesn't like blinking, fake scientist. That's when he finds out about Theranos. (laughs) That's when he finds out about, what's her face, Elizabeth. Can you imagine, like, they could not blink at each other for hours. Oh my God, can you imagine the fly and Theranos lady just in dueling black turtlenecks being like, (laughs) our new creation, which we are taking to Silicon Valley, it's called mandibles. Yes, everyone has mandibles. And it goes back to that union busting thing too. There you go, yeah. Hey, listen, are your Amazon warehouse employees like- Busting (laughs) unions (laughs) makes them feel good. (laughs) Listen, it's really hard to form, <laughs> really hard to ask for a living wage when you have six uh, extending mandibles. Uh, no one, you can't uh, type too well. It's a dream match made in hell. Exactly. We are completing the capitalist nightmare mm-hmm. <laughs> that Kafka always wanted to tell. Speaking of dumb tech bros, someone I went to high school with was one of the right hand men to uh, well, Elizabeth of Theranos. He's in the documentary. I double taked. I thought. That can't be that guy. I remember being a dick from high school. It fucking was. Anyway, just a little fun fact. Did he have little pincers like shooting out of his mouth and like scurrying little bits of crumbs you and know, sugar cubes? Uh, in metaphorically, there? definitely, because a little bit of footage was them like dancing to like a rap song at a party, and this guy was about as unfly as a white guy can be. <laughs> It's, it's Seth Brundle's like most horrifying thing. Somebody who just is, ain't fly like a white guy. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, so I, wow. I think we have to ask at this point, yeah. right? Like, do we ship it? I got to say no, because I feel bad for Gugor. Yeah, I think even as bad as he goes in the story of the metamorphosis... I don't think there. It's only it's only worse for him. Like he, he was already having this. a bad day and he had a bad life. Yeah. This just made it worse. We need to get Gregor a nice, like, Bernie Sanders type bug. Someone who's going to fight for the proletariat bug. Not a bug that's going to take advantage of him. We need to, to We need to match him up with Woody Allen from Ants. Oh, God. <laughs> well, that's problematic for a whole host of no, other reasons. No, we need to, it's Gregor, the, the better ship would have been I'd Gregor with Samsa it. and the B from B movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. Wow. Well, this has been a... Uh... Insightful, intelligent discussion. <laughs> Truly, this Ugh. is the lowest that Franz Kafka's work has ever been oh, dragged, oh, and that's yeah. saying something. He yeah. really wishes all his work had been burnt like his will said, and Max <laughs> brought his friend had and said, sure, whatever you say, and then not listen to him. Make sure I'm never on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Dies. Oh, wow. Yeah, he just, I'm pretty sure he just rolled over in his grave. Love you, Franzi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, while we keep buzzing about that ship, Uh, We're going to take a quick break and be right back with our horrifying matchmaker segment. (laughs) 
Halloween matchmaker segment here at Ships in the Night. Let's open the doors to the dating service. Charlie, we hear you have a friend oh boy. who needs love. This, 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 uh, he's having trouble back there. So we're going to... I, 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 I'm helping out my friend here. My friend is colloquial, colloquially known... As the bum behind the Winkies in Mulholland Drive. <laughs> Jesus Christ, Charlie. <laughs> I know, I know. That, hey, you asked me. We've had some deep, deep cuts on this segment before. Bob the <laughs> Goon, Station from Bill and Ted. That's a good one. But this is the deepest cut we've ever heard. All right. That said, we are always up for a challenge. So t- tell us a little bit about so, your friend, the bum from behind the Winkies the in bum, Mulholland Drive. The bum, the bum behind the Winkies uh, diner in Mulholland Drive is sort of a dweller on the threshold sort of character who in our world looks like a dirt caked, drugged out of their mind, street transient, but secretly holds the key to supernatural universes within universes and maybe is uh, in control of all of Hollywood from the top to the bottom in a dark, deep way. And uh, they're looking for someone who won't faint away dead at the sight of their face and someone who might want to go for the gusto into a sort of interdimensional uh, relationship that could span time and space and arguably a non-linear way into dimensions connected to portals all over the connected uh, David Lynchian universe uh, into even the small town of Twin Peaks or Buenos Aires or New York City, (laughs) if you want to go into Twin Peaks season three in the wider context. And we do. I know I do. Boy, howdy. (laughs) Dang, you just got me started. Hmm. All right. Well, uh, we've we've done. We definitely dug through our files on this one. Luckily, our our we have extensive options at hand. Mm. So, Greg, why don't you give us your idea for who to set up the bum from behind the Winkies Diner with? So, the bum from behind the Winkies definitely a, a bit of a dirty character, if you will. Someone who maybe you'd expect to be screaming on the subway, possibly addicted to drugs. You know who else was screaming on the subway incoherently? The mom from Requiem for a Dream, after she's all coked out on all of her diet pills and everything. And you said you wanted someone who can live in a different time. I would argue, mom from Requiem for a Dream is already living in a different time. She's screaming about how she has to go on a date with her husband. She wants to be on camera. She needs to be ready for it. So she is going to go to Hollywood Hollywood and grab the bum from behind the Winkies and say, Sir, you have to make me a star. Look at my dress. It's so pretty. And I think that they are going to make the ultimate bum Hollywood power couple. Dang. Mm-hmm. That's pretty good. It's a little bit of spice. I dug through my records and I thought of a good <laughs> one for you. Indeed. All right, that's it. That's I. I see it. I definitely see the. the it's also like just thematically across the different, like this very specific. You also have a kind of East Coast West Coast thing going on. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's keep that one going. Because here's the thing. I think what you really need for the bum is you need somebody who knows what it's like to live on the streets, but also live as part of a bigger universe. And I'm talking about Oscar the Grouch. Because Oscar, one of, first of all, the obvious, knows what life is like on the streets, knows what it's like to live in filth, enjoys living in the filth. There's not going to be any arguments about getting off the streets with Oscar. But what Oscar also has is when you really get down to it, what is a Muppet? They're an immortal being because they will (laughs) never die. In the 30 years that Oscar has been around, he has not aged a single day. Who knows what properties Grouchland even has and brings to the table. You've got two eternal beings that live on the streets. He lives literally next to a door. He's essentially a gatekeeper in and of himself. And I think that these two will just be so happy being miserable together. Wow. That's incredible. So, Charlie, we uh, presented you with a couple of options here. Yeah. Now, do you have questions for us? Well, I would like to ask, what do you think their meat cute would be? Oh, that's a good one. Oh. Okay. How do they... Uh, your scene, I, I can see how the Grouch might... They might bump it in the street, but your character has 3,000 miles to traverse to get to L.A. to start. So mm-hmm. what's going on there? Okay, that's fair enough. I mean, technically, we both are have people on the East Coast. <laughs> oh, fair enough. Yeah, Sesame Street is also East Coast-based. It's, it's in New York City. Are, oh, for jeepers, it is. I'll show you how much I've been watching that lately. 
<laughs> All right, so we got to right. figure it out. Yeah. It's the meat cute. I All think right. I have an answer. All right, Greg. Winkies is obviously a chain restaurant. <laughs> so we have both an East Coast and a West Coast Winkies. And being an interdimensional bum, he can go to any coast that he chooses to be on. So I think that the mom from Weck Room from a Dream stumbles off the subway in front of a New York Winkies, and who should come out from behind a dumpster but the bum. And she grabs him and says, I need to be on camera! And he says, well, I can make that happen for you. And would you like to maybe get a slice of apple pie? <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> Zach? See, Oscar, also not not a uh, not unfamiliar with the cameras. I mean, that's the thing. Oscar is a being who jumps between realms. He's in like in the world of Sesame Street, but also jumps just like the Muppets into where, our well, where real Where does his world. bottom half go? Yeah. <laughs> So who knows what's through that trash can? <laughs> that trash can might just pop him up in LA to go visit the behind the scenes on the Muppets lot. Oh my God. And while he's here, he's looking for a place to hang out. And like, yeah, people hang out in the diner, but not Oscar. Oscar hangs out behind the diner. He would. Dang. Wow. And that's the meat cute. Those are the ideas. So Charlie, we got to set your your friend, the bum from behind the mm. Winkies in Mulholland Drive. I just they're, like saying the whole thing. They're it's itching for it. Man. Uh, we got to set them up on a date. We got we want to find them true love. So mm -hmm. who do you want to set your friend up with? I'm going to have to go. Okay. So the puppet thing, sure. Right. Uh, eternal life to be cranky together. <laughs> but these uh, the bum the bum gets off on scaring people. And and the kind of human interactivity, I think it would get tired of the felt after a while. You feel the felt <laughs> once, felt done. I think the Says slight you. edge. Well, we can. I don't want to hear about that. <laughs> <laughs> a slight edge, and we're talking the slightest of edges, has to go to Requiem for a Dream Mom. Yeah, I have to say, because that's enough. even worse to picture. It really is hor Like she is horrifying in her own that is a right. A genuine horror film in and of its own. That is a itself, true yeah. Lynchian pairing if I have ever heard it. It's pretty brutal. <laughs> so, Charlie, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you for having me. This has been a delight and a half. Uh, this is a blast. And you've got a bunch of horror stuff that That's people right. can That's check right. out. You've got yep. a film doing the festival mm -hmm. circuit right now. Yes. Tell us about that. Tell so, us where people are going to be yeah, able to watch it. Uh, so, uh, my latest short horror film is called Malakastraka. It's kind of a psychological horror film with a lot of practical creature puppet effects. It's been making the fest circuit all across the world this uh, from last year to this year. Uh, it's next going to play the Nightmares Film Festival in Columbus, Ohio. It will also be in Sheffield, England at the end of the month. Next month, it'll be in Mexico City. And then at the end of the month, it will premiere online for anyone to see on the Director's Notes website. And then a week later, be also online through Alter, which is the Gunpowder and Sky channel devoted to short horror films. And you can find that on YouTube and Facebook come end of November. So look for that. Look at look for Mala Kastraka. You know it. Coming to an internet year, near you and maybe a festival, depending on where you happen to be mm -hmm. listening to this. It's so cool. And the creatures are so goddamn creepy. We got some real gnarly, the, the effects artist who built the creature puppets in this. I uh, used to work for him. He's a legendary effects artist. He made Elmer in Brain Damage and he worked on the Basket Case films. He did Leprechaun. Uh, he made the Leprechaun and Leprechaun. Nice. Yes. He's on Gremlins too. He did all of Matthew Barney's Cree Master Cycle. His name's Gabe Bartalos. If you like creature puppets and weirdo stuff, yeah, keep your eyes peeled for this. I think you'll dig it. Awesome. And where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter at Inherent Charlie and on Instagram as C Piper. Nice. Greg. You can find me on the tweets at Greg Goodness. You can also find me performing occasionally at the Pack Theater in beautiful, sunny Hollywood, California, behind the Winkies. Woo! <laughs> I've actually been to that location, by the way. That diner is shut down, but I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> that Charlie has replaced the bum behind the Winkies. <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, um, I'm Zach Wilson. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at that Zach Wilson. And also find me uh, on a my other podcast if you like Marvel stuff called Marvel Movie News on the Popcorn Talk every Thursday. 
Uh, then, and be sure to follow the podcast itself. Be sure to write, like, rate, subscribe, click the buttons all wherever, whatever app you're on. There's always a button somewhere. <laughs> um, and you can find uh, the socials for the podcast at Shipping Pod. And be sure to send us the ships that you want to see next. We've got two more weeks of horrifying, spooky Woo! shipping to do. Uh, and they've got some amazing stuff lined up. People coming back who have been on the show before that I think you guys are going to really enjoy. Uh, so until next time, this has been Ships in the Night, casting off. <laughs>